Hey guys, welcome back to Magic TV. My name's Craig. It is nine o'clock on a Monday, which means it's time for a five by five. Now, this is where I take five things related to magic. I spend five minutes talking about each thing. I move on to the next subject. It's always quick. It's always snappy. You never know what you're going to get. And today, I'm back with another one of my performer highlights. Now, this has been a really popular series over the last couple of months. And I've had lots of people suggesting names of uh, magicians that I should highlight on these performer spotlights. Now, if you don't know what it is, the idea is simple. I take a particular magician, a particular performer, Performer, and I play you five clips of them performing a live situation, a live performance from that performer. I'll then talk about each sequence and I'll tell you why I think that shows why they are such a good magician. Um, it's, uh, it's part of the thing of me being all positive and happy all of the time on this channel. And today I'm going to be talking about uh, somebody who is a legend in the magic community, somebody who is unfortunately no longer with us, but uh, their legacy will live on forever because of how much they did and how much influence they had in the community while they are alive. And I am, of course, talking about Eugene Berger. Now, if you've never had the pleasure of reading some of Eugene's books or you've ever had the pleasure of watching him perform, um, you're in for a treat and you really should check out um, the, the plethora of work he, he, he has um, that he brought out over the years. You know, you can go and look at so many different videos of him performing. You can go read his books. He was very influential in my career. Uh, as a close-up magician, especially when I was reading his his early works and uh, the books that he brought out from Kaufman and Greenberg, um, a lot of the routines that he uh, he he described really kind of shaped the way that I perform or I think about magic. Now, Eugene, one of the things that really stood out for me about Eugene Berger was a his look. He had a very distinct look. But more than the look, he also had a very distinct voice. His voice was made for telling stories. It really was. When you started uh, listening to Eugene Berger talk, it was almost hypnotic. You, you'd fall into a trance. He had one of those voices where he could literally just be reading a shopping list and you would find it entertaining and you would find it engaging and Really, anybody who wants to learn how to do story-based magic should watch Eugene Berger perform a lot. And on this video, I'm going to talk about five different live performances. It was so hard to pick five because there's so many that I could pick from. But I think that the first video that I'm going to play you um, is, is something that Eugene became known for. I think that uh, a lot of people said that Eugene Berger has the best performance and presentation of gypsy thread ever and I, I really wouldn't disagree with that I, I i fully agree if you haven't seen it you're in for a treat so the first video we're going to be looking at is eugene berger performing gypsy thread a single length which will represent the entire universe in the stories of india it is the god brahma who creates the universe and all that there is. Brahma then retires, and the god Vishnu takes over, and Vishnu sustains and preserves the universe in every moment of its existence. And then, at the end of time, the god Shiva appears, and dances the Tandava dance, a weird and terrible dance of fire, in which the entire material universe is destroyed in blinding light, brighter than 10,000 suns. And the universe is no more. There is only silence, vast cosmic sleep. And out of this cosmic sleep, Brahma wakens himself again. He looks about and seeing nothing. He decides to create the universe again 
and creating it, he retires, pleased with his eternal plight. So Gypsy Thread is a very direct trick. I mean, if you actually think about it, it's very, very direct. You show a piece of thread, you break it into lots of different pieces, you take those pieces, and you restore the thread. It's a beautiful piece of magic. It's something that you can perform close up, but it's something that you can also perform on the biggest stages. Ryland actually does a version of Gypsy Thread in his uh, in his stage show. And you know, you you see routines like Gypsy Balloon and Gypsy Yo-Yo uh, that have taken this concept to an entire other level. But what Eugene did, and the reason that a lot of people say that Eugene Berger's handling and presentation of the gypsy thread is the best that's ever existed is because of how he presents it and really go back and watch that performance again this is a master class in how to present magic and and tell a story that people find interesting you know it's fine to there's nothing wrong with presenting magic by saying look i've got a piece of thread here if i break it into a million different pieces and then take it and put it back together it becomes one long piece that's fine there's nothing wrong with that there's a market for that and that's the way that i present magic a lot of the time but if you're confident in telling stories and you're confident in presenting magic to take that trick to the next level, then it really can do that. And that's what you see in this performance. What you see is a trick that's much bigger than the sum of its parts because A, it's performed absolutely flawlessly, but B, as well as being performed flawlessly, it's the story, it's the narrative that's presented over the trick that, that kind of really draws you in. Every single moment in the trick is punctuated with, with, with a moment in the narrative. And I think if there's anything that shows the importance of scripting, it's this particular performance right here. Um, if you've never performed the Gypsy Thread, really this is a performance that you should study and it's a perfect example of why Eugene Berger was held in such high esteem by everybody in the community. He took something, he took a routine that a lot of people do and he made it his own, not by changing the method really so much, not by adding bells and whistles, but just by sitting down and thinking, well, what can I say? What can I do with this particular routine that takes it to another level? Anyway, with that being said, let's talk about the uh, the next routine. And the next routine, we're going in completely the different direction. We're, we're gonna watch Eugene Berger perform magic with sponge balls. Interested? Check this out. And for your assignment, it is a great pleasure to be here. Thank you. One of the questions that I'm often asked is whether I hide things in my beard. <laughs> I do. <laughs> what do you think it is? It's like a little red ball. Oh, you've played this before. <laughs> Have you ever heard of sawing a lady in half? Yeah, no. Yeah, I've always dreaded this moment, you know. <laughs> Climb up on the table. <laughs> Just teasing. Okay. But I asked you that for a reason. Yeah. Because this is called sawing a red ball in half because you get two of them. <laughs> now they look alike. <laughs> well, uh, this one squeaks and this one doesn't. <laughs> Or is that the one that squeaks and that's the one that doesn't? I squeak. <laughs> now, Simon gets the first question. Of course, you will get the hard ones. Thank Hold you. your hand palm upward. This one over here. A little time on the rack and you'll fit perfectly. <laughs> now, if I took one red ball and put it in my hand, one in your hand, hold it tightly. If I took mine and threw it to you, now think, how many in my hand? <clears throat> it could be anything. Uh, one? <laughs> Not very good with numbers, are you? Wow. How many in your hand? Uh, one. I can feel it. Mm -hmm. Open your hand. Ah. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> the questions get harder. Really? Addition. One plus one equals... Two? The thing to remember. Magicians cheat.
One plus one plus one. Here's where I trick you. Minus one goes back into my pocket. How many are left in the hand? Two. No, I cheat. But I just told you that. <laughs> here, hold your hand palm up here. <laughs> the hand with the nice watch. Thank you. <laughs> if I took all three of them, here, hold them very tightly. Please let go of my finger, thank you. Now, if I didn't do anything at all, how many balls in your hand? Well, I think there are three, but... How many do you think you really have? It feels a bit more, but... But three? <laughs> Slowly open your hand. <laughs> So here's the reason I wanted to include this video. First of all, sometimes I think that as magicians, we forget uh, or we overlook the power of tricks that we consider to be too simplistic or tricks that have been around forever. We're always chasing that latest and greatest trick and forgetting about how powerful magic can be that we perform for years and years and years. And sponge balls is a perfect example of that. You know, I don't perform sponge balls anywhere near as much as I used to. And I've had an argument in the past, not an argument as in a rah, 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 but I've had a debate in the past with uh, Sean Farquhar. Um, simply because I said to Sean, hey, I don't really do sponge ball magic. And he's like, why would you not want to do sponge ball magic? It's some of the most powerful magic that you can do. It happens in the spectator's hands and the reactions are always insane. And that's a world champion, a multi-time world champion saying that. And it, it kind of makes you think, okay, well, maybe I'm missing a thing here. And then you see somebody like Eugene Berger, who's going on a TV show here. He's performing this on television. He knows it's going to be filmed and it's going to be presented to people potentially all over the world. And he's chosen to do sponge balls because he knows that the reaction is just going to be far and beyond a lot of the other stuff that you can do. And I think there's a couple of things that we can learn from this. And the first thing is, like I said, don't overlook the classics of magic. They're classics for a reason. Just because you think sponge balls might not fit you, you know, I'm, I'm sure there's an argument to say that sponge balls isn't the sort of thing that you'd immediately think of Eugene Berger doing, but he does it and he gets a great reaction from it. Uh, the second thing is think about the choice of material that you're performing, especially if you're being given an opportunity to perform on television, because one of the big things that you need to do when you're performing on television is get that reaction. How do you get that reaction? You get that reaction by having that sponge balls moment when they open up their hand. Look at the end of the performance when the woman opens up her hand and there's like an explosion of sponge balls coming out from her hand. She doesn't see it coming. She freaks out. That's good television. Um, and also don't forget you know I see, do see people doing sponge balls but they just vanish them all at the end um, look at the way that it's been done here with the production of all of those sponge balls it is the equivalent of what you see Tom Stone doing with the Benson Bowl routine you know when he does Benson Bowl and all of the sponge balls appear and it's an incredible moment to finish that's what we have here with Eugene Berger so don't overlook sponge balls they are a fantastic prop and when I was looking and researching into Eugene Berger and I was making a list of literally dozens and dozens of videos I whittled it down to the ones I wanted to use and I really wanted to include the Spongebob video because the Spongebob video I think really just kind of shows just the most important thing about magic at the end of the day is that it's entertaining. Now there's lots of different ways to entertain people. You can entertain people by telling a wonderful story as you're performing a piece of magic with a thread. But it's equally valid that entertaining people involves just having fun with them and showing them something that they've never seen before with these wonderful, these weird little red sponge balls. And, and don't overlook that, I think it's important. So from that, we're now going to go uh, and have a look at another routine. And this is a card routine by Eugene Berger. Uh, so let's have a look at this one right now. One of the questions people ask me is, whether I have certain secret preparatory exercises. Do you? Yes. In fact, I'll show you one. It's done with the magician's friend, a pack of playing cards. And first of all, you can see that these cards really are quite mixed. Mm -hmm. Here's the idea. You square the cards up, you place them down, you think of an ace. 
take a deep breath. And you cut. Twice. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's try it again, shall we? Why not? You think of an ace. And you cut to one. Oh, I know this seems rather amazing, but I bet you could do it too. Do you want to try? Yeah, you. Here, think of an ace and cut the deck. Okay, think of an ace. The ace of hearts for you. <laughs> well, that's not bad, but of course, you are now going to be defending mankind everywhere. The pressure's on. The pressure's on, the exactly. Gauntlet's the gauntlet's thrown. been thrown, exactly. Mike, do it. Cut the deck. Turn the card over. <clears throat> well, yeah, but, but you did it the hard way, right? Say yes. Uh, uh, yes, yes. Yes, okay. well, M, first letter of your name. I, K, and wouldn't you be surprised if this were the ace of spades? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you didn't even know it. Yeah, okay, are. so what we have here is we have a, a cutting the aces routine where you have Eugene Berger doing a cutting the aces. Uh, and, you know, I, I have spoken to many magicians in the past who overlook for ace routines, uh, especially ace productions, the kind of thing, oh, yeah, it's another ace production. What's the point? Uh, it's it's just magical masturbation. I've heard people say yeah, four ace productions and magical masturbation. I do a lot of four ace production routines, and uh, they always get a great reaction. And you can see in this video that Eugene's performing to two people, and both of them are completely blown away by this trick. Now, this trick might seem simple to your average magician, but look at the reactions that, that Eugene's getting. And there's a couple of things, again, that we can learn from this. And sometimes, uh, well, the first thing that I learned is it's okay to do something simple. Um, it's okay to do something um, that's not incredibly difficult sleight of hand. You know, I'm sure with Eugene's skill, he could have done multiple different ways of achieving that, had them appear in a way more visual manner. But sometimes we we make things a bit too visual. I was speaking to Lloyd Barnes about this the other week, and he was saying that, uh, that, that he thinks that the best way to actually do something is when the magic happens in the mind of the spectator. And what I mean by that is if you're going to do a twirl change, for example, or a shapeshifter change, that's a visual change and it may look great, but if you do a double lift, for example, and then put a card onto the spectator's hands and hand them hold on, have, have them hold on to it, and then that card changes in their hand, they haven't seen the change. Technically, it's not as good as a shapeshifter. But from the audience's point of view, they'll find it more impressive with that moment happening in the hands of the spectators, uh, or that, that, that even though they don't see the change, it's more impressive, right? And it's the same things here. It's a very direct, well thought out way of producing the four aces. Um, the other thing that I learned from watching this is always have that final moment. If you're doing a multi-phase routine, which in essence is what a four ace routine is, you're producing the aces one at a time, it's important to have something different to punctuate that final moment. And I've seen a lot of people and they just produce the aces and they'll look, there's the first one, there's the second one, there's the third one, there's the fourth one. But what we're doing here in this particular video, what Eugene's doing here, is he's producing the aces and then the final one, first of all, he's getting the spectator to cut the cards themselves themselves which is a really nice moment because it's put it it's empowering the spectator it's getting them to do the magic but then you've got that kind of magician in trouble scenario where oh hang on that's not the right card but look it's an indicator card and it indicates where the card is but look at how eugene handles that magician in trouble scenario it's not like he does what a lot of magicians does where he goes oh it's gone wrong oh well it's gone wrong oh hang on for a minute and it kind of uh, makes things a little bit awkward like the audience really thinks that the magician's messed up how eugene's handling it is they cut the cards it's not the card and eugene just says well you did it the hard way that's what you did you did it the hard way that was even more impressive which one makes it even it empowers the spectator even more 
And two, you've still got that magician in trouble scenario, but now you're not making it feel awkward. You're kind of saying, well, hang on, it's correct. So now the audience is intrigued. Well, what do you mean it's correct? How could it be possibly correct? That's not an ace. And it's exactly the same approach to that final ace. But presentationally, he's gone into it in a completely different way, which doesn't make the spectators feel awkward, doesn't make the audience feel awkward, and it also empowers the spectator that's done that final cut even more. And I think that's something that we could learn from watching this performance as well. Now, one thing that I've, I've gone through in the last couple of routines is even though Eugene Berger was an absolute master at close-up magic, a lot of the stuff that you're going to see in these videos are very, very simple. And I think that sometimes we overlook simplicity. And um, the next trick is a perfect example. He's going to do the classic coin through, not coin, sorry, he's going to do the classic glass through the table that everybody learns when they first get into magic. And he's going to kill with it. Watch this. But now that we have a coin, we have a coin that has, we'll call this heads because there's the head of the Statue uh -huh. of Liberty. And the other side is called tails because, uh, well, in this case, I don't know why it's called that. Like, I, I guess because it's not heads. Here is a game, and I know you two will like playing games, particularly you, because I know that guys with facial hair enjoy playing games. Yes, I, I know this. <laughs> so, here is a game, and it's a game that has been used for many, many years to swindle people. <laughs> You're going to swindle us. Yes, I think that's the idea. Here's the idea. We'll call that tails and that's heads. Uh-huh. In fact, I'm going to move the carpet so that you can see this a little clearer. The coin is placed flat on the table and it is covered with, in this case, one of my business cards. The okay. business card hmm, is covered with the glass. And the glass is covered with several paper towels. And the idea is that there is no way that you can see that glass, or that coin. Mm -hmm. And if you can see the coin, my darling, I don't want to play the game with you. <laughs> but here's the game. The coin is put flat on the table, covered with the, the card. And if you say heads, Tails will be on top of the coin and you will lose. Okay. Mm. If you say tails, heads will be on top of the coin and you will lose. In other words, grim as it sounds, whatever you say, you lose. And I can do this a thousand times. Okay. Mm. What do you say? I don't remember what you put it on. Oh, well, I, 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 I didn't tell you, right. Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> That's what makes I'm, it a game. I'm going to say tails. Tails. So I have to make heads on top. Right. How do I do that? Magic. No, you see that little movement? You see, you would not have even noticed the movement if I had not pointed it out to you. But that is the movement that's important. Now, I will not even touch the coin. You said heads, or you said... What did I say? Tails. You said tails. I said tails. You will see that heads are on top. Yes? Wrong. Well, this is so that she's willing to put up money. You see, well, we'll try it again. Here, heads or tails, what do you say? I say heads. And you see the tip. It's heads. You're very good at this game. One more time, heads or tails? Um, heads. Heads. Here, hold your hand out like this. Okay. Ready? Uh -huh. You're really good at this. Uh. <laughs> 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 and I got it wrong, too. <laughs> now, admit it, right? Admit it to me for a minute. Everybody that's watching this video learned the car, the glass through the table or the salt shaker through the table when they first got into magic. It was one of the first things that they learned when they bought their first magic book or they really properly started buying tricks from a magic shop. Very early on, you learned that trick and you decided um, not to perform it uh, because everybody knows how to do it or it's too simple or whatever the reason may be, right? Well, what we have here is we have one of the greatest close-up magicians of all time performing a routine that most magicians would overlook because it's too simple. And look at the reactions that Eugene is getting from this trick. Look at the reactions. It's not like it's a very muted um, reaction. It's not. And the reason is, it's a bloody good trick. If you actually think about it, you know, the focus is on the coin going through the table. And then all of a sudden, boom, the glass goes through the table. Something that they never ever ever see coming and i'll tell you right now i'm guilty of it i'm guilty of overlooking this trick and kind of saying to myself you know what i'd never perform this and there's lots of times when i am in a situation where i can perform it there's a lot of times when i'm performing at a wedding or a private party and there's lots of tables and i'll sit down with them and there's napkins on the table and there's salt cellars and there's glasses and watching this video honestly made me think 
I know this trick. I've performed this trick in the past. So why would I not perform this trick now? Because lay people aren't going to know it. They're just not. It's not the sort of trick that you kind of find out about as a lay person. You find out about it when you first get into magic. But the reaction that it has, pushing an actual... It's a little bit like the... Um, the bottle through the table, which let's be honest, Faye Presto made her career doing the bottle through the table, but without actually needing to go to the trouble of using a bottle or using a gimmick. You know, you literally just pick up a glass, wrap it up in a napkin and you're good to go. So I think if there's one thing I've learned here, it's not to overlook the tricks that I consider to be too simple because they're probably just as powerful. And it's it's the argument that I make with, uh, you know, I've had people on this channel in the past say, oh, Craig just tells jokes that everybody knows. You know, it's a tired joke, you know, it's, a, it's a hack lines or whatever it may be. And here's the thing, it's true. I do have a lot of lines in my repertoire that um, magicians have been aware of for years and years and years. And my argument is... Um, to the people I perform for, to the lay people that I perform for, that I'm booked to perform for, they've never heard those lines before. So I don't care if magicians heard them a million times. That's not my audience. Well, it's the same with the trick. You know, this trick might be old hat. This trick might be something that every magician in the world knows. But I'm not performing for magicians. So why wouldn't it work just as well if I started performing it now? And that's what I'm going to do. Anyway, we're on to the final video now. And the final video, uh, I'm going to call it the Torn Card Revelation. Uh, and it's a great trick. I, I, You know, I had to watch it back three or four times because the first time I saw it, it absolutely fooled the pants off me. I was like, hang on a minute, how is that possible? Um, and it's a great trick. And I want you guys to have a look at it right now. I've never seen this before, I'm, I'm, ever. Um, and I really wanted to share this with you. So let's have a look at it. 25, but who's counting? No. Uh, My age. This is very special. Take the cards. Mix them up. That's enough. Now, don't make it too difficult for me. Um, here, spread the cards in front of your face so the faces are toward you. But hold them up because sometimes I'm not trustworthy. Uh, take out a number card. Not a picture card. A number card. 12 less to deal with. Thank you. I'll take the deck, you keep the card. And on this side of your card, write your first name right on the card, but hold it up. I'll take the pen, show the card to Simon, to camera two. And you have to remember the card, or this is fairly meaningless, if not futile. Say stop. Stop. Put the card back right there. I can do this two ways. You too. <laughs> About 30% of the time, I actually do it psychically. Wow. <laughs> and the rest of the time, I cheat. We found that out. Didn't yeah, exactly. We? Exactly. <laughs> Take the deck, cut it into three sections that are fairly equal, and then put them back together again in a different order. This is the motor skill part for you, my dear. Perfect. Now what I'm going to do is give the deck a single cut from the two of diamonds to the ace of spades. And if I could do that every time, I'd be in Las Vegas right now. The glass is empty. The deck goes on top of the glass where I can't mess with it. And my hand is empty. Name the card. Five of hearts. You're not going to believe this. I know, I'm not. Now. <gasps> Wait a minute. There's the five of hearts, and look, your name is still on it. So that's the, uh, as I say, I'm going to call it the torn card revelation. Think about how powerful this is as a trick. You know, the, the, the spectator signs the card. There's no ambiguity there. The card is absolutely 100% signed. And the card is lost into the deck. And then, and then once the card's lost into the deck, you're then in a situation where you put the cards on top of the glass and boom, a piece of that card, the card that they just signed falls into the glass. 
And then all of a sudden is they spread through the deck and there's one card with a corner missing and it's their card. And this was filmed a long time ago. This is like Angle Z before Angle Z even existed, right? And I, I, I was completely fooled by this. And, and the reason I was completely fooled is because they signed that card. It's not like he was holding on to the card and getting them to sign it. He was like, yeah, you want that one? Okay, sign it. No problem. Just sign the card. Um, it, it confused me. And then, uh, you know, having watched it a few times, I now understand what happens here. And I'm sure if you go back and watch it a few times, you'll understand what happens as well. You might even know this trick, and it was something I wasn't aware of. But the thing that kind of struck me when I watched it back a few times is the importance of taking your environments um, into consideration when you're performing. So the method behind this, or at least what I believe to be the method behind this, is something that's very much dependent on um, the fact that Eugene sitting down behind a table. But that's absolutely fine. You know, sometimes, and I've done this, I've, I've done this where I say, hey, um, I don't lap. I don't do any lapping because it's not practical. But the bottom line is there's a lot of times when I'm in a situation where I can lap. There's a lot of times where I'm performing uh, in a close-up show and I'm sitting behind a table. Or if I'm performing in a sort of a, uh, a gig where there's lots of tables and I'll sit down with people every so often. There's lots of times where I'm in a situation where I could lap, uh, but I choose not to. Even though I've transitioned from my normal environment into an environment where lapping would be appropriate. Um, and I think it's important to have a plethora of material that will work in every environment and more importantly, not just work in every environment, but take advantage of the environment in which you're performing in to, to, you, to help you create the best possible magic that you can do. Because I believe that we owe it to our audiences to do the best type of magic that we can do. And if we can improve our magic or we can create stronger magical moments by using the environment in which we're actually in, in a way to make that magic more powerful, then that's what I think we should do. And that's what Eugene has done here. And the actual effect, again, it's very, very simple in terms of, you know, Vernon always said, didn't he? Uh, an, a, a good magic trick can be described in one word or in one sentence. Uh, if you look at the trick, Chipsy Thread, uh, hey, the magician tears up a piece of thread and then puts it back together by magic. Sponge balls. Um, some balls disappear and appear in the spectator's hands and then multiply, um, cutting the aces. The spectator uh, watches as the magician cuts the four aces. The last card is done by the spectator. Uh, the glass through the table. The magician pushes a solid glass through a table. And this one, this torn card revelation, a sign selected card is, is caused to penetrate through the deck part of a sign selected card is caused to penetrate through a deck of cards into a glass and then the rest of the card is found in the deck. Like, it's all very simple. It's all very easy to describe. It's very easy for the spectators to follow. Sometimes magic can be convoluted, and sometimes magic can be all over the place, but in the case of the magic that Eugene performs, it's very simple, it's very direct, it's very powerful, and sometimes less is more. Sometimes it's good to strip away what we're doing to the bare bones and then just make sure that everything is fully understood. And I think that's what I learned from watching this performance. So there you go, guys. That's another 5x5, five five, a performer special on Eugene Berger. Now, and as I said, unfortunately, Eugene Berger is no longer with us, but his legacy lives on. And you can still get his books and his DVDs and his projects. And I really would advise you to look into those because they're fantastic. Also, more importantly, uh, let me know what you think in the comments down below. And if you want to see these done on other magicians and other performers, again, let me know in the comments down below. If you want to see more videos like this, like the video, subscribe to the channel. Don't forget, I'm going to be back again tomorrow with another video and if you haven't already done so go check out the netrix it's www.thenetrix.com you can go check it out and see what a little fuss is about but i'll be back again soon with another video thank you so much for watching my name's craig from magic tv mm -hmm.